This seminar is for educational purposes only. It is not a substitute for professional medical advice or treatment. Consult with your medical provider for medical advice or treatment. Although the presenters try to keep the information in this seminar as accurate and timely as possible, the speakers and Mather Hospital assume no duty to ensure the seminar is error-free. The speakers and Mather Hospital are not responsible or liable for any claim, loss, or damage resulting from you viewing this seminar. Good afternoon and thank you for joining us today for our Healthy you webinar series. Today's webinar will be discussing CyberKnife for treating lung tumors. At any time during the presentation, please feel free to enter any questions you may have using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We'll answer as many questions as we can within the time allotted once the presentation concludes and your questions will remain anonymous to protect your privacy. I'd like to introduce you today uh, to our presenter, Dr. Joseph Cerrone. Dr. Cerrone is the Director of Precision CyberKnife of New York using state-of-the-art radio surgery for his patients at New York Cancer and Blood Specialists and Mather Hospital. He first became interested in radiation oncology field for the challenge of mastering a single modality to treat patients and for its multidisciplinary approach towards cancer treatment. During his radiation oncology training, he learned how to treat all types of cancer and has treated many difficult cases. Radiation oncology has been used in many areas to eradicate cancer while preserving function of the treatment site. Such sites include head and neck cancers, breast cancer, and rectal and anal cancer. Dr. Cerrone graduated from Albany Medical College and completed his residency in internal medicine at North Shore University Hospital, which was affiliated with Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. During his training, he spent much of his time at Memorial Sloan Cancering, Can Kettering Cancer Center, where he first learned to take care of cancer patients. He later trained at the radiation oncology program at Downstate University Hospital in Brooklyn and subsequently became an attending physician at Long Island College Hospital in Brooklyn. Dr. Cerrone, you can go ahead and get us started. Hi, so welcome to this uh, talk. I think uh, I told their uh, coordinators I would present a little bit more about radiation therapy for lung cancer and really an overview about the current state of different treatments for lung cancer. So um, this is the first slide. Uh, lung cancer had been the most common cancer uh, throughout the world. And over the past two to three years, it was overtaken by breast cancer. And um, though the next slide uh, still shows that lung cancer is responsible for the most cancer deaths. The only difference uh, in this slide is that the most cancer deaths uh, in females is still from, is from breast cancer, but overall lung cancer, colorectal and liver cancer has more uh, deaths uh, overall. So um, it's still a very serious illness. It's a common Ill illness. You know, what are the causes? Everybody knows what the cause is causes or the most common cause for lung cancer is, and it's smoking by far. Um, also, uh, radon gas underneath the your houses and the houses that we live on, but generally not a common uh, a high dose uh, that could cause, cause the problems. Asbestosis we're all aware about does can cause a factor with uh, lung cancer air pollution, big city areas, secondary smoke. Genetics also plays a role in uh, incidence of lung cancer and uh, can increase two to four times. One, we can go back to that. Uh, one more uh, risk factor is uh, the uh, use of radiation therapy. So radiation therapy, uh, patients who are younger uh, can have risks of lung cancers later on in their life. Patients who have been treated with Hodgkin's disease as young people can get lung cancer or breast cancer uh, later on in their life. So radiation is a risk factor. Years ago, people were treated for uh, acne and thyroid conditions, uh, but we find out that was not beneficial. So radiation also is a factor uh, for cause of lung cancer. We can go on to the next one. What are the symptoms of lung cancer? And they're very nonspecific. 
you know, patients can develop fatigue over some time, can develop a cough, shortness of breath, chest pain, chest pressure, you know, loss of appetite with the, this fatigue, coughing up phlegm or hemoptysis or coughing up blood. Um, this is a common and a serious fact, you know, if the cancer has spread uh, and symptoms include bone pain or difficulty breathing, belly pain, headaches, you have brain metastases, bone metastases, this is with, with, with later on in the symptoms, but patients can uh, present with these later symptoms. Most commonly, it's really, you know, some kind of shortness of breath and some chronic, you know, fatigue. So we can go on to the next slide. And, you know, the types of lung cancer, uh, typically um, non-small cell lung cancer is the most common type. It's separated into three types of non-small cell lung cancer, adenocarcinoma, squamous cell, and large cells. These are all treated very similarly. They do have a little bit different uh, ways how they act and spread and treat and, uh, and are controlled, but they're treated very similarly. Uh, small cell lung cancer is a little bit different. Uh, it is more what people consider a systemic disease. It is radiosensitive and chemosensitive, but it has a higher propensity to spread. Uh, but if it is localized, there's a good chance of controlling it locally and it can uh, respond to treatment. Uh, mesothelioma is uh, one of the types I'm not really going to talk about because it's really on, an entity onto its own. And it's a very uh, it's a rare, an uncommon, but not so rare type of uh, lung cancer. And it generally is a, affiliated or associated with exposure to, mesothel to asbestosis and uh, smoking. Asbestosis increases the uh, risk of mesothelioma. Smoking increases, can have mesothelioma, but it's usually lung cancer. But if you put the two together, there's a, there's a much higher incidence of uh, lung cancer and or mesothelioma. So it, it's an unusual cancer. It's an aggressive cancer that can spread locally and distantly, very, not very responsive to chemotherapy and radiation. The best way to treat is if it's localized, you can treat with surgery hopefully patients can do well, but generally they present later on in uh, the progression of the disease and they don't have a great outcome, but we catch it early, we can do well. So we're gonna move on to, this is uh, what we see, what we can see when patient has an early stage disease. And this is asymptomatic. This is, you're not gonna have shortness of breath. You're not gonna have chest pain, anything like that. This is something that we, would find on uh, CAT scan screening uh, evaluation. Uh, patients who have lung cancer uh, and have, uh, uh, patients who do have a history of cigarette smoke, if they have over 30 pack year cigarette smoking history, smoke less than 10 years prior, certain uh, criteria to get a screening CAT scan. And if you can get a screening CAT scan, it could show something like this. This is a small nodule in the lung. Um, and generally, I'll go into the treatment of this later on. There is some controversy, but really standard treatment is to have it removed with surgery, generally a lobectomy. Um, but the, we do have very good results with the cyber knife and what we call stereotactic body radiotherapy, which I'll get into a little bit later. More commonly, patients present with this situation where they have intermediate or a localized disease to the chest. This is an example of not a, only a CAT scan, but a PET scan. A PET scan uh, not only gives dye to the CAT scan, but it gives a radioactive glucose molecule, gets, it, gets taken up into the cancer cells. And then when you they photograph it with the CAT scan, it lights up uh, where the disease is. And typically, this this says stage two, stage three disease with the mediastinal lymph nodes centrally uh, in the chest, and then the larger mass peripherally. Um, this treatment 
once it gets to this stage, generally surgery is not considered, but chemo radiation is. And we'll go into why uh, that, why the results are treated uh, like that. Um, we can go on next one. This is, you know, unfortunate patient with someone later in the progression of disease that probably has had some shortness of breath for some time and now has collapse of the right upper lung and extensive mediastinal disease. So we do have patients present like this that probably have a chronic shortness of breath or a cough and then when they get an x-ray, it's unfortunate. Again, not a surgical candidate, chemo radiation most likely. Uh, and sometimes we can still do well with these cases. So we can move on uh, to, you know, so what happens when you, when you have an abnormal x-ray, a CAT scan, something like that? Uh, the first things you're gonna do is uh, your primary doctor will send you to the oncologist for the most part. They may send you to a pulmonary doctor or maybe whether the pulmonary doctor found this. They'll do a biopsy and find out that you have cancer. Um, once that's done, um, they come to us. What we do when we see is we get the history, we do the radiology, review the pathology, confirm what type of cancer it is. And then we put you to the stage of disease. The stage of disease helps determine the exact treatment that you're gonna get. And then, then, so once we get put all of this together, we look at the patient, look what kind of, how old they are, what kind of um, performance status they have, if they're walking around, if they're severely short of breath, and that could determine the course of treatment also. So we can move on. Um, so like I said, once the patient has a diagnosis, we find out uh, how big the tumor is, is the, is the lymph nodes involved, and is there distant disease outside of the chest? So that's what we call staging. The staging, the current staging is an AJCC eighth edition. It's by the T1, um, you know, is less than three centimeters grouped in a few different sizes. T2 is less than five centimeters, three to five centimeters. T3 less than five centimeters, seven centimeters. And then end disease, it, it's a hyler the mediastinal disease, or if it's contralateral chest or the other side of the chest or in the superclave area, it's N3. So, and then M1 is when it's distant disease. So we put this all together and we get a patient stage and that's a stage one, two, three, or four, goes up to four. And then we decide, then we can have, um, make treatment recommendations. So typically, you know, when we are trained in our, uh, field, uh, we should know how to treat all these different kinds of cancers. As you get out, there's definitely things change over the, over, uh, the course of treatment. From I, be, I was trained, I'm not going to say a long, a long time ago, but over 20 years ago, and things somewhat change over time. So you want to keep up with the most standard treatments and most current treatments for these patients. One of the things that we use is this website called National Comprehensive Cancer Network. It has every cancer, every stage of cancer, and then it has recommendations of treatment depending on the performance status of the patient. So once we do that, just go back once, please. So um, the, the, the staging guidelines are generally updated once or twice a year. You can see that this non-small cell lung cancer uh, was just updated early last month. So this has the newest recommendations for treatment, and it does help us sometimes during the consult, we will talk to these and outline these with the patient so we know that they know that we're, you know, up to date with what we're doing. You can go to the next slide. And that's uh, the clinical stage. Uh, just like I said, you get the clinical staging, initial evaluation on the left, and what we're supposed to be doing, stage one, two, three, it goes to all these, then it goes to pre-treatment eval on the right. And so all of these, it has recommendations for each stage, different things like that. So you can go on to the next one. So this is for uh, just an example of one of these that we saw before. So for a stage with mediastinal biopsy, uh, T, T1s, N2s. So it gives you, and then in the middle, it says initial treatment. So surgery and or chemo radiation. So depending on these are the things that we recommend or could offer to the patients um, and we can go 
uh, on to the next one. So what I wanted to talk about also is what standardly we do for uh, non-small cell lung cancer. I'm gonna talk about what, uh, what we do for small cell lung cancer. And then I'm gonna go into what we do for peripheral cell, peripheral uh, non-small cell lung cancers, which not so much controversial, but there is some, uh, some issues in, uh, in the use of precision cyber knife. Um, there's gonna be some graphs and there's gonna be some studies here. So I hope it's not too much um, for anyone who's on the line, but hopefully I can answer your questions uh, later on. So moving on, uh, now we can stay to the last one. So, uh, so the th few areas that we want to talk about was unresectable non-small. So that was in the intermediate stage where the, the large mass with the disease centrally in the chest, non-surgery, um, and those are treated generally with chemotherapy and radiation. Post-operative radiation, if someone has a lobectomy and then they sample the lymph node, sometimes we treat mediastinal, the mediastinal area for positive margins and or positive disease, but we don't have to treat if there's N1 or hilo lymph nodes. Then I'm going to talk about inoperable small tumors, like I stated, and then palliation of metastatic disease, if the disease spreads to the bone or to the brain, I'm not going to talk about that so much, but that's, uh, we'll go into that a little bit. So you can go to the next slide. Next slide. So this is just the initial data or study that was done. It was done a number of years ago, over 15 years ago, comparing sequential chemo and radiation, concurrent chemo radiation, or concurrent chemo and twice a day radiation. And this was for that intermediate group that we talked about. And you can see that ARM2 um, has the better median survival, 17 versus 14 and 15, and old five-year overall survival, 17 versus 10 and 13. You don't think these are big numbers, but they were better than they used to be. And now those numbers are better um, than, they, than even this study was. Um, of course, when you treat the chemo and the radiation, uh, you had more side effects, uh, but now the current way to treat these tumors is with the combined modality treatment, chemotherapy and radiation, and then follow that with immunotherapy. And that really prolongs the patient's uh, overall uh, progression, free survival and overall survival. So very beneficial to these patients. We can move on. And this is what I was mentioned. Years ago, we didn't use immunotherapy, but probably the past five years, it's been very important immunotherapy, it's a little bit different than chemotherapy. It's agents that are used to promote cancer death by stimulating the patient's immune system. Uh, generally, different side effects from chemotherapy, but are well tolerated. You can have allergic reactions and rashes, but overall tolerated pretty well. The, t the ones that we use in FINSI uh, is used after chemo radiation, and it definitely improves patients' uh, survival. And then if patients have stage four disease, then in addition to chemotherapy plus or minus radiation therapy, there are other immunotherapies that can be used, Keytruda and Optivo. They also uh, can, um, can increase the patient's uh, longevity. Uh, of course, you have to have certain markers to get these, but if, if you do have these markers, it can be, be very beneficial to the patients. So we can move on. So like I said, the standard therapy for um, intermediate uh, disease, chemo radiation, is about is six weeks of treatment currently. Um, sometimes we'll push the dose up to seven weeks of treatment. It's every day, Monday through Friday, 15 minutes a day. Um, and the post-operative dose is a little bit less, 5,000 for positive lymph nodes, 6,000 for positive margins, but still five or six weeks of treatment. Generally, uh, and then palliation of metastatic disease, bone or brain disease could be, you know, two weeks to three weeks of treatment, really to limit disease from growing and causing symptoms. Patients can still do well uh, in a number of these situations. So what are the side effects from the radiation? You can go back. So um, you can get cough. One of the main cough, fatigue, um, trouble swallowing, if the lymph nodes are there, 
you can get trouble swallowing like I'm having now from talking. But um, it is some discomfort. And that's the most common thing. We can give patients a miracle mouthwash or carafate, and it does help uh, uh, with the swallowing, maintaining nutrition during the treatment. A rare uh, side effect is pneumonitis or irritation to the lung tissue around the area that was treated. And that you can have severe cough, you can have shortness of breath, and it can be debilitating and you have to treat that with steroids. We see a, a lot of times we see scarring and irritation from the radiation, but we don't see the pneumonitis symptoms. So it is a, a rare complication, but we, we treat that very aggressively uh, and follow patients closely. Um, we can move on. So that was for most of the common uh, cases for a locally advanced non-small cell lung cancer. <clears throat> now we'll move on to small cell lung cancer. And the staging is similar to the non-small cell lung cancer, but traditionally we always thought about small cell as limited stage versus extensive stage. And what's limited? Limited stage is radiation as a, a radi uh, disease confined to one chest area. So you can get radiation to the area confined to one side of the chest. Extensive stage is any disease outside of a radiation portal. Um, so, but that's commonly with lymph nodes in the abdomen, bone disease or brain disease. So limited stage is about 30% at presentation. And those patients are treated with concurrent chemo radiation, very similar to the non-small cell lung cancers, but it's treated with different chemotherapy agents, cisplatinum and etoposide. And then sometimes we treat patients with twice a day treatment versus once a day treatment. And I'll, we'll get to that in a second. So extensive stage when disease is outside the uh, radiation portal, chemotherapy is the primary treatment and radiation is used for well, consolidation if they have a good response or for palliation of different symptoms. Um, commonly, the small cell lung cancer has a very high chance of brain metastases either at presentation or sometime during the course of treatment. So there is a standard treatment of treating PCI or what we call prophylactic cranial radiation for in limited stage disease because that's when you see the benefit. And a meta-analysis was done comparing uh, or 25 gray and 10 fractions uh, versus no treatment. And the treatment to the brain did decrease the metastases at three years from 60% down to, you know, from 30%. And uh, and the and there wasn't all, the patients did have a five percent five and a half percent overall survival, so it is recommended in limited stage disease uh, to decrease the metastases even if they don't have brain disease at that time. The study said there was no difference in neuropsychal uh, data, no brain damage, no memory. Sometimes we do see that later on, mainly because the patients been treated with chemo, and then they get a small dose of radiation. Uh, so it is something that we follow, but it is still beneficial to the patient, still a recommendation. We can move on. So like I mentioned, uh, that sometimes in small cell cancer, we treat the patients with twice a day radiation. We call it hyperfractionated treatment. And this was a study performed in 1999, uh, comparing uh, chemotherapy and radiation. And it was once a day, uh, ARM2 was once a day for five weeks versus a twice a day protocol to, for four weeks. The same dose was given. And you can see that uh, with the results for local control and overall survival, that the twice a day treatment was beneficial um, to these patients. And we do, do do that. When we were doing the twice a day treatment, uh, 3D conformally, it was very difficult. The patients had a lot of esophagitis swallowing issues and cough. And it was rare to get them through the course. With the newer way we do it with IMRT, the patients are doing better. So with limited limited disease, we can consider twice a day treatment and it could be beneficial. I did have a problem with this study in that we don't treat the patients once a day to 45. Generally it's you know to about 6,000. So it is a different protocol, but this, uh, Twice a day was compared to a 6,000 protocol, 
and st still showed some benefit. So if the patient's motivated and we can do the twice a day treatment, we do consider it in limited stage small cell cancer. We can move on. So after we decide on the treatment, you know, what exactly uh, do we do? Um, we, um, we do a simulation or a planning session. We have a CAT scanner in our office and the patients get set up in the treatment position with a very quick practice. There's no contrast, no dye, just for the body um, to be uh, adjusted to in the treatment position. Then we draw out the area where diseases, you can see that on the right. Typically we take the patient's PET scan, we can put it or fuse it over the CAT scan so we can see exactly what we're gonna draw out. And then we treat this area. You can move on. So this is the area uh, that where the disease is and we drew it out, you can see. And then we drew, drew the outline of the area that's gonna be treated. This is really an older depiction of how we, treat, of how we treated patients. This was 3D conformal technique with, uh, with blocks drawn. And you can see that the full dose of treatment is given from the front of the body to the back of the body. And um, this was the only way that we had to do it uh, for the longest time. And after about five weeks, we would turn the field off the spinal cord and make a little bit of an angle to go up to the dose that we wanted to do. It worked fine, but it was treating a larger area than necessary. So you can move on. And this is not a great slide, but it does show uh, the IMRT technique that we use where most of the dose is cent centered right on the disease where it needs to be treated. You can see there is some scatter around where the dose is, but that's really very minimal disease, uh, scatter. So it doesn't cause any symptoms but the hot air disease is right where. So it's been very beneficial to the patients to decrease their side effects, maximize the disease to where the disease location is and, uh, and minimize side effects. So it really helps uh, the patients. You know, this is the most common way we treat patients. So you can go on. And this is a, uh, just a uh, diagram to show of the three different types. I didn't talk about the proton therapy, but it is a newer type of treatment. It's not available for everyone. It is, we do have a new facility in Manhattan. There is an older facility in New Jersey, but there's none on Long Island right now. And what this shows is that you can see where the orange is, is the really kind of where the hot dose is and can cause issues. So with conformal radiotherapy, the older type, you see that's a lot of orange you know, in that field in the lung to the left lung. So you can have a high dose. This is what we had to do at that time. But with um, the IMRT, you can see the orange is less and it's conformed very uh, tighter to the uh, mass in the left lower lobe area. And even more so, you can see that with the proton therapy. So the proton does uh, decrease the scatter but because the low dose on the IMRT is very minimal, we don't see a lot of problems with that. And it is still the most common treatment. So in certain situations, proton therapy can be used and can be beneficial, but not, um, not generally in this situation and at this dose. So this is just to show, you know, that there are different treatments and the, the scatter radiation doesn't make too much of a difference, but you still want a tight field around the tumor. We can go on. And this is just one of the newer linear accelerators uh, that we have in our office. We have this in our Riverhead office. We have an older unit in our Setorkid office, and we have a different brand new linear accelerator in our Patrick office called the Halcyon unit. These newer units um, called True Beams and or the Halcyon can do radio surgery very similar to the uh, CyberKnife unit. So you can move on. And this is, a, this is a picture of our CyberKnife unit. You can see it's a lot different than the linear accelerator. It has a standard uh, robot type arm that, that spot wells uh, machinery on the assembly line. The difference is the head of the unit. That's the uh, radiation producing 
unit and produces the photons, very similar to that big unit where the Lindy accelerated just before. We're very happy to have, go back please. We're very happy to have this CyberKnife unit, which we've had it for over seven years and been treating a lot of different cancers and it's been very beneficial to all the patients that we can treat. So you can move on. So the CyberKnife radio surgery, it's only radio surgery unit highly precise, non-surgical. Everyone thinks, oh, it's surgery. It's non-surgical treatments of tumor anywhere in the body. You've heard about the gamma knife treatment that really just treats radio surgery, but it's just in the head area. But the cyber knife, we can treat patients in any other parts of the body. There are multiple non-coplama beams aimed non-isocentrically, so not including the whole tumor, just points in the tumor uh, to, to very tight or minimal margins. We can treat patients in, in the brain, in the spine, in the lung, the pancreas, the liver, the prostate, and bony sites throughout. So very beneficial and other, you know, very beneficial to a lot of patients. We can move on. So what I was stating about uh, early stage lung cancer is that it's most commonly seen in patients over 70 years old. Generally, they're long-term smokers, have COPD, and the surgical resection is the standard of care. Most commonly, it's a lobectomy. So it's not just plucking out this small tumor that you see. The control rates are greater than 70%, probably less than 70%. But it is not just plucking out that small tumor that you saw, but it's uh, taking out the lobe and that gives you the best results. Lesser surgeries, sub-segmental sub lobectomy or wedge resections have higher control rate, higher recurrence rates. But in this group, about 20 or 30% of patients are inoperable. They have severe COPD. They have bad cardiac disease, so they can't have the surgery. So what are their options? Their options are radiation therapy. Previously, when we treated patients with external beam radiation, we couldn't go to a high dose. We had a lot of lung damage. So the control rates were less than 70%. So they weren't very good. They didn't pro progress the patient's lung, but we didn't have great uh, options. And IMT was better, but we still can do to, didn't go to a great do good dose for very good control. That's where CyberKnife or SBRT comes in. Next slide. So CyberKnife radiotherapy, um, this is a study in patients who were inoperable. The patients had tumors less than five centimeters and they had small cell or metastases, small tumors. They had, to treat with CyberKnife, we need fiducial markets placed. That's how it's tracked with the x-rays on the CyberKnife unit or on the ceiling in the room. And uh, we need fiducials placed. We can track patients with, with spine too if it's a if it's close to the spine. So the dose fractionations were three treatments, five treatments, and the biologic effect of the dose to any of these fractionations were over 100, which was different than what we could do for, uh, for the standard external beam. So the 55 patients, T1s or T2s, and the control rates at three years was 90%, really very good. The distant metastases in, in T1s or spread of disease was 15%, but it was higher in T2. So a little bit, that's for over three centimeter tumors. So it can still happen, but this was very um, uh, important result to see that patients with small tumors can get very good results with high doses of radiation that can be tolerated very well. We can move on. So this is just an example of uh, cyber knife treatment. You can see uh, the beams in blue, a CyberKnife treatment can be 100 to 150 beams given over 30 to 45 minutes. And you can see the tight conformal treatment to this left upper lobe nodule. Um, very limited do dose to the other lung, to the other part of the left lung. So you don't get a lot of side effects from this. And even this one, very close to the heart, there's very minimal or no heart dose. Very minimal heart dose, I can't say no. So very minimal heart dose, uh, which shouldn't cause the heart any issues. So this is gets a high dose. You can get some rib irritation, but overall, this is a given a high dose and you have a very high control rate. 
you can move on. So I was at uh, a lung cancer, uh, a radio surgery conference a few years ago. And the presenters uh, had a debate with a radiation oncologist and a chest surgeon, you know, to see which would be best for them. And they were comparing the data for uh, radiation therapy for this is operable stage one lung cancer. So small patients who are in good performance status, even though the, pay, the surgery is really to recommend the treatment. So they were just saying, this is, can't believe this is happening. So this is really, um, you know, futuristic. So let's move on. And you can see that in, um, this is a study just comparing medically inoperable and operable patients, you know, inoperable patients have a lower survival rate because they have other comorbidities and problems. And the overall survival um, with the, um, was better uh, with the radiation therapy. The control rates though for both of the inoperable and operable patients were very similar, 85, 87%, which was very good. And the toxicity was very low. So what's the next thing you have to do is compare the, in, the operable patients with surgery to operable patients with radio surgery. So we can go to the next slide. And you can see there were a few studies that, were, uh, that had this protocol, but they weren't accruing very fast because no one really wants to do surgery or not surgery. So they did pool the study and you can see that with the saber or the, the radio surgery uh, arms for the overall survival uh, with operable patients was better than with the surgery arms. It was uh, 70, um, 95% to 79%, 79% um, you know, over, over three years. And this was, you know, very good result. And the progression-free survivals or control of disease, again, was very similar at three years, maybe a little bit higher with Crohn's, but very similar, not worse. So you, you, the, the answer, the question is, why isn't, surgery, why isn't radiation done, you know, in these groups when they can be done very safely, better results than the surgery? You can move on. So the surgery... You know, a surgeon came on and said, yeah, you get pathological saving, yes, which you don't get with the cyber knife. You only treat in that area. But if a PET scan is negative, it should be fine. But you get the lymph node evaluation. You get tissue from molecular studies if you need anything. You get good residual radiologic de defect where the tumor is out. Um, and long standing, you have very long control, very long experience with this. Late complications are rare. And the patients just do very well. Um, so that's really the debate. I mean, can we use it in operable patients? The, the answer is yes, but still the standard of care is surgery and radiation reserve for inoperable patients. So you can move on. So this is just reviewing that. So start, current standards for inoperable patients is radiosurgery. Current standards for operable patients is lobectomy. But you saw that the radiation data is just as good or better. So we may be using that sooner, but I, without really having good studies, and there are on, ongoing studies at this time to see that the cyber knife uh, can be very useful uh, in this situation. You can move on. <clears throat> so I know I went over a lot of stuff and I talk fast and I hope I didn't confuse anybody. But maybe if anybody has any questions, uh, you can ask them at this time. Thank you, Dr. Cerrone, for that awesome presentation. Um, like he said, if anybody has any questions, you could answer them in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. I do see we have one right now. What is the criteria for a lung cancer patient to be treated with proton therapy? Um, there's, really, there's really none. It's, sometimes it's, it's insurance. Sometimes insurance um, for a localized treatment, uh, they won't approve it because it just costs so much. So um, you can be, usually it can be retreatment to a lung area. De novo cases, you know, you can be treatment if, if that's the case, but you need insurance. And sometimes insurance are getting very difficult because it's costly. But it can be treated in any of these situations. It's just difficult to get treated and it's not 
in everybody's backyard. Dr. Saron, why don't you walk everybody through the what the process would be to make an appointment with Precision Cyberknife of, um, of New York, like Joanne Mursica's role? Well, she gets the she gets the treatments approved, but the first one is to call the Precision Cyberknife office or New York Cancer and Blood Specialist, and we get you in for the initial consultation. Like we go through all of that stuff. This is could be after you have the biopsy, before you have the biopsy. If you have a lung cancer question, we can see you before that, anything like that. We'll be happy to see you. The doctor sees you and then make sure you go along the right avenue um, and being seen with the right other doctor. So it's you can call the office, um, uh, any of the offices, the New York Cancer or Precision Cyberknife. If, uh, you, if anybody would like the number to Precision Cyberknife, you could reach them at 631-675-5399. I'll say that one more time. 631-675-5399. Um, Dr. Cerrone, that was a great presentation. One more question for you. What is recovery time like with Precision CyberKnife for treating lung tumors? Um, generally, there is no recovery time. <laughs> Patients... If the patient has you know, a small tumor in the lung area, it's rare to get a cough or fatigue or shortness of breath, but you can get minimal cough, minimal fatigue. Recovery time is very quick. I mean, really patients do very well with a small lesion being treated. Okay, great. Looks like that's all of the questions we have right now. Um, thank you everybody for joining us today. You'll be redirected after the webinar to take a brief survey. Um, if you could please fill that out, it helps us plan our future programs and understand anything else you guys might be interested in. Uh, thank you, Dr. Cerrone, and everybody enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.